All right, welcome back to the Illini Enquirer podcast, and it's that time of week to catch up with Michael, too, of everybody's favorite part of the week. And it's uh, another week where they split games here, Mike. Ohio State lost at home, which obviously hurts given that you don't control your own destiny anymore, but you do bounce back with what I thought was a, an impressive, especially offensively, win uh, at Michigan, 93-85. to 85. And let's start uh, on the offensive side of the ball because that was the most complete offensive performance we've seen uh, against a high major opponent, against a Big Ten opponent, highest points uh, per possession this year, what, one three two, which is just ridiculous. Uh, it's kind of the performance people dreamed about in August, right? When you're thinking Andre Curbelo, Trent Frazier, Kofi Coburn, uh, a bunch of shooters around him, and, and Alfonso Plummer went off in the first half. So um, that, was, that was fun and pretty to watch. Make a couple free throws, you're hitting the century mark, right? So this offense... And just the pieces alone, if you want to break down each piece and if you just kind of put them on the open market, there'd be a lot of coaches out there. Just uh, give me a plumber, right? Give me a Kofi. You know, I think everybody would want a Kofi. And, you know, and, and then what, what Trent does, right? And just his, the way he picks his spots and his, his patience and he's, then in the end, he comes up big and, and he's timely and he's clutch and, uh, and then Curbelo, what he does offensively too. You know, I understand the four turnovers. We'll get into that later because I don't think they were all on him. But I just think the way that they have all of this, and we've been working this season just to see, can we put it all together in time with as much, I guess, illness and injury that there's been? And I think you're starting to see that certainly on the on the offensive end. And um, when Plummer's having his eruption and. Kofi's just solid and patient and Curbelo, same thing. And then Trent's just kind of picking his spots. It's, it's a really hard team to beat on that end. And then I'll factor this in too. A lot of teams have good pieces when you talk about their first three, four offensively. I think what really puts you over the top is those, that next wave of guys. And Jacob Grandison, Coleman Hawkins, DeMonte, they just have great feel. You know, they have really good feel for the game and, and, you know, I, I know Coleman's been a little bit more confident shooting it lately, and DeMonte's proven that he's been able to do that. And and Jake's at 41% from three. Good on the list, man. I mean, it's it, they're a really tough group to stop and a really tough group to to scout for. Yeah, I wanted, we want to get into Curbelo. Hawkins with his big performance. We kind of saw all shades of uh, Alfonso Plummer in this game, the great and the not so great. Uh, and Kofi, uh, Put himself, I don't think he's ever fallen off, but uh, certainly made another case for Big Ten Player of the Year uh, if you want to make that kind of case. I do want to ask you on the flip side of this, uh, Michigan, uh, 1.2 points per possession. They make another late surge, and these late, uh, these long droughts or allowing teams to go on these long runs, I know it's part of college basketball, right? It, it just, it's part of the game of basketball, uh, all these kinds of runs. But is there anything you're seeing, any kind of trend you're seeing uh, with the defense because they are playing tougher teams down the stretch here, Mike, some of the best offenses uh, in the country they've been going up against, obviously with Purdue, Ohio State, Michigan's one of the best uh, offenses in, in the Big Ten despite their down year. But in five of the last six games, I think Illinois has given over 1.1 points per possession here. They're, they're some of the you know, most worst defensive efficiency performances they've had. So uh, what kind of level of concern do you have there? Are you seeing any trends there? I, I really, it's, it's weird watching the the game yesterday. I thought it was a little bit of, I think I texted, I think it was a scoreboard game. Yeah. And the energy and effort that they played with, the alertness on the rotations, and that shouldn't have resulted in 85 points. And I almost was sitting there in the first half, like how does Michigan have 38 points right now? I, the way guys were flying around and, 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 that's why you go back and you continue to watch film because you can see the certain aspects of it. And, and there were some times where, you know, they either gambled or didn't get, you know, didn't get the defensive rebound led to another possession. But I, I do think some of the late surge stuff, and I've heard a lot of it. I, my personal opinion, I think that's a little bit of recency bias. Um, there's plenty of games this year that, you know, where Illinois has shut the door, if you want to call it Wisconsin, not too long ago, Indiana, not too long ago, um, Michigan at home back in January too. You know, you, you blow it open in the second half. You don't take your foot off the gas. You win by 15. Those games have happened. It hasn't been 
a reoccurring thing all year. But I also like to say, hey, other teams deal with this. How about Illinois? How about Illinois comeback against Ohio State? Right. What are you saying if you're a Buckeyes fan? What are you saying if you're a Rutgers fan where RJ Melendez is almost bringing you back into the game there? I mean, Ohio State, even a couple couple weeks ago in Mackey. Right. I, I mean, it happens do it at home. Right. I mean, it's a late surge to get that to overtime. Exactly. So, like, it, you know, it happens. Right. And I think the one thing that you want to go back to is, is if this is a massive fundamental issue where guys aren't rotating, they're laid on rotations, this is why, then that would be a completely different issue. I saw a team yesterday that was on their P's and Q's. It's crazy that it resulted in 85 points. It really is. On their P's and Q's with rotations, scrambling, knowing the scout. I mean, there were some things here and there. I'm and glad we'll you mentioned the, the scrambling. Point. There were a few possessions where – like Coleman was late getting down or Andre was late getting down and they were scrambling. I'm sure you'll have this in the film room, but like they, they just shut down possessions. Michigan should have scored on the fast break and they just shut them down. It's amazing. Some of the, some of the plays that they did shut down the way that they rotated, they took a lot of points away from Michigan and Michigan still had 85 points. I, it's a good offensive team. And, and, and we know that I, I think I would think this is much more of a concern if it was a, actual fundamental issue and there are some things don't get me wrong there are some things you showed in the film and namely it's the whole alfonso Plummer thing it's like Plummer giveth Plummer taketh away in some areas and that's where you start getting into this debate this i guess this conundrum if you will of like we want to play you 30 minutes because of what you offer offensively not only just from a production standpoint but from a from just a attention standpoint from the opposing defense but Man, if this is what we're going to get defensively, we'll play Andre Corbello even more minutes because we know he can do a lot of things offensively. And he probably had his best defensive performance yesterday. It was not perfect. He gambled a few times, but oh my goodness, he was insane. He had some, and I was, oh, I was like laughing to myself on the couch watching that game and even more so when I watched the film. It was some special stuff, man. Uh, and that's, that's bad news for Alfonso Plummer. It, you know, if you, if you're looking to play, and I'm not saying Alfonso Plummer is going to play 15 minutes, but it's going to be really hard to play him 35 minutes in a game. If, if you're going to get these stretches of just, I, I don't even want to call it. It's, some of it is unexplainable and, and I'll try to explain it in the film session. I don't know what, what's going on in his head for, for with some of the stuff that's going on, but it, it's March now. Yeah. Right. And I know we've been talking about this all season. I'm not sure if it's going to be rectified. I'm not sure if he's going to change it. I I think it's kind of just who he is, but he has the moments. And I think that's what frustrates a coaching staff is he explodes, he slides, he takes a charge on the ball. And you're like, yes, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be a once every 20 possessions thing. Right. And then all like Devontae Jones, you know, the, the scout is not to go under everything on him, but you went under on everything on him. So it's just, it's assignment stuff. And I think that's the stuff that this staff, you know, holds in pretty high regard. So if Andre Curbelo is going to do those things and be in cruise control on the offense, on the offensive end, and I, I mean, what do you do? I, I, it's tough, man. I mean, it's, a, it's an embarrassment of riches, okay, if you want to call it that. Because most teams have to play Alfonso Plummer because they just, they don't have another guy that they can bring in. Yeah, just to hit on the defense before I get to Andre Curbelo because I want to lead you into sure. there. Um, that you look at the point distribution of Illini opponents, they are they are last, which is good, in giving up three pointers is amount of the points other teams get. So 14th in the Big Ten is great. That's what Brad Underwood wants. No, no three pointers. Second in two pointers, but a lot of those we've seen, Mike, uh, are, are you know mid range jumpers, and I think Brad Underwood will take what Tyson Walker and. Besides some layups, Devonte Jones were hitting in, in these two games at uh, in Michigan. I think the one concern I have is no one was following a lot. They're, they're following a lot and giving up a lot of free throws, and that was why Michigan at the beginning of that or middle of the second half was able to kind of make that run to trim it to five. Is nine of their thirteen points during I think that thirteen two run were all free throws. Like it's it, they they got to stop following, especially these cheap ones like eighty feet from the basket. Those are the ones that they have to get rid of. Uh, some of the other stuff is 
tends to come at times out of mismatches. Yeah. And, and the other thing too is it's, it's the next step for Coleman Hawkins. The next step when you're guarding the ball on the perimeter, second that ball hits the ground. I actually did hear one of my buddies that played at Wisconsin. He had mentioned this. They do a drill where they hold tennis balls in their hands. So the second you put the ball on the ground, you, you can't put your hands on the dribbler. And that's where I think Coleman can take this next step. It, and it was exactly what happened at the end of the Ohio State game. He reached down E.J. Liddell, right? And that was it. And he was out. Mm -hmm. And if he can take away those fouls, and then the, the flip side of that too, I'll flip it back to the offensive end. During that stretch, you're missing free throws. So it's a, you can't miss free throws and have them making free throws. That's, that's when you start to see these, these late surges. So we talk about the defense, and that's one of the other points I want to make with these late surges. If, you, if you're not making free throws, you're, you're giving the team a chance to get back in the game. I, you know, that's, that's just kind of the way that I look at it. But limiting those, 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 those fouls that are running into shooters, Jacob Grandison did in the second half, and, I, and really, we'll go look at the film, was not Jacob Grandison's fault. Yeah. Uh, he kind of had to, to make a play there and try to get a contest. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to try to fix that, and, and part of that is just being sound and showing your hands on the drive. They, they've really changed that. Well, I think maybe it was like my last two years where they started to do the whole like cylinder hand check thing. And it was just, they, they ran wild with that. And it felt like every single time a guy put the ball on the ground, a guy would throw his head back and they would just call a foul. So they've done a better job with it. And that's where I'll, I'll credit the refs, but you got to help yourself too yeah. and not put yourself in a position to get those, those cheap ones. Brad Underwood said after the game, Andre Curbelo looked like Bello. And I, you don't want to like say, yep, we're going to have that the rest of the year. But even Andre after the game was saying, that's as good as I felt in a really long time. He just looked comfortable. He looked confident. And he seems to, he was talking a lot about accepting his role, Mike, which is, hey, if I got to play defense for this team now and Trent's the lead guy, that's fine. Uh, if, if I got to go get some buckets and, and be a run killer, like he shifted the momentum in that second half several times with some of these dribble drives, Kofi had a beautiful seal to get him an easy layup where he just kind of laid it up and held it there. Um, that that's, that's a dangerous weapon and, and other opponents got to be like, dang it. Now that guy's back. That's going to be tough to defend. I, I debated tweeting this during the game. I, it, it gets to the point when he has those games where he looks like Bello again, where you think as an opponent, it's like, this is, a, you got this guy coming off the bench. You're like that's unfair, man. And, and, and I think. Potentially the best point guard in the big 10 is coming off the bench. Yeah. When he's, yeah. When he's right. I, I think he's the way he controls the game. And then now the element that he's adding defensively, he's, he's up, he's right there. That's for sure. And look, I, I think, like I said, he had one of his best defensive performances of his career and his rotations, his awareness. I talked about fighting through screens. It, it, I'll show the clip in the film review. The defense he played at the end of the first half on Devontae Jones, getting through screens, walling him off, and forcing Devontae Jones into a 12-foot fadeaway air ball. Uh, that's the type of stuff that's going to continue to get you minutes. And look, 84-80, right? He makes a rotation and, and goes vertical. I know they call it mozgoffing, uh, you know, on Caleb Houston there. It won the game. They won the game. And – if Caleb Houston dunks that, you know, if it's an and one somehow, now you're talking about 84, 83, 84, 82. And then, you know, Jake misses the shot. If Coleman doesn't track it down, that's why it was cool. You know, Coleman and Bellow back-to-back plays kind of sealed it for them. And I'm not mentioning Kofi. I'm not mentioning Trent. You know, I'm not mentioning Plummer. It's these, it's these other two guys that I thought played a big hand in that. And look, I, I think – it's that for Corbello, it's that defense and rebounding. When It's like, hey, listen to the coach, right? Coach says, well, we're going to need some defensive and rebounding down the stretch. And if Andre Corbello is the guy, as you saw yesterday, defending like that and being able to rebound like that, you're going to see a little bit more of Andre Corbello. I, and, and I think, you know, some of that too is just that defense and rebounding, it's going to increase his minutes. And then if he continues to look settled on the offensive end, like we talked about, uh, he won't be coming out much. He won't. So whose minutes is that going to chew into? And I think you can probably do the math on it, but 
look, I understand four turnovers yesterday. One was a carry, which I think you could arguably call a lot of times down. They should have called one on Devontae Jones and I, in, in the first half, and, and Brad Underwood wanted it. The other one was Frankie Collins raked his arm as he was going up for a layup. Ball flies out of bounds. The third one was Jacob Grandison just tossing the ball to him with two seconds left in the shot clock. He tries to go make a dribble move and gets the ball taken. And the last one was the worst one. It was just, it was, he tried this post entry pass, kind of like he did it with Marquette at Marquette with Omar Payne. Like I'm going to slide the ball into Kofi gets picked off, but this is the difference. Okay. And I know you think, I know, you know, I'm about what to say right now or what I'm about to say right now, turns it over. Okay. The very next defensive possession was the charge that he took on Hunter Dickinson. That was the very next one off of just an insane read and rotation. Wasn't worried about the turnover. Didn't dwell on it. And that's it. You can, you can talk about the defense, the rebounding, the maestro and ball screens. That is how you know that Andre Corbello is, is really turning the corner. Because, you know, Mike, early in the season, we were talking about it, all the film rooms, like one mistake. He was worried about the refs not calling something compounded to another mistake. Last couple of games, man, uh, actually, since he's really come back, like remember what was the Wisconsin game or he had a, a bad play turnover, comes back, steals the ball. Like he's just he's he's locked in uh, and, and then he's confident in offense and it could change his team. Right. I mean, we've been waiting for it, waiting for it. And Brad Underwood's been patient and he hasn't been putting too much pressure on him. And it seems like uh, they're feeling good right now, heading into March 1st tomorrow. So I think that's working well for him. I mean, they should be. I, I, I think you, you could yesterday, the, the 93 points that they scored. I mean, it's not like they hit 16 threes, right? I, I mean, a lot of it was just, you know, Grandison back cut, Coleman hits them for a layup. I mean, they're playing. And I thought the blend, the blend was what the difference was. Yeah. Uh, and oftentimes you talk about the dry spells and the stagnation. Part of that comes from running the same thing. We're going to throw it into Kofi every single time. And when that doesn't work and when guys aren't in a rhythm, hello, dry spell, right? And when you blend it like they did yesterday, three-point shooting, pistol action, high ball screen. Now you're worried about the three-point shooting. So now we're going to go to Kofi. And now you're just – you're glued to your men. And it's Kofi on an island down there with, with Johns or with Dickinson – and we know Dickinson doesn't want to foul, so it's it's still a good one-on-one -on -one matchup. And and I just thought the way that they blended that, I it's almost like they used at times it's like we want to throw it in the Kofi to start the game, throw it in the Kofi, great. And they did that a couple of times, but it's almost even better when you when you've gone away from it because you're bringing them up in the ball screens to use Co throwing it into Kofi as like we're dropping the anvil right now that's almost an even better way to use it at times. And I thought, here's the thing with Kofi, and this is why I think sometimes he looks tired out there, is when you throw the ball in for a guy to back his man down 40 times in a game, that's going to wear on a dude. And if, you, if you're Kofi, let's try to find him some easier looks. And some easier looks are just off those ball screens where he gets a free run at the basket, catch, finish. And he doesn't have to be the one who receives the ball. Trent gets downhill puts it up on the rim. Like we talked about Trent needing to do more, puts it up on the rim. Dickinson has to go help, has to go contest. Kofi gets a free run, offensive rebound, layup. Those are much more, I guess, easier looks where you don't have to exert yourself so much. And they blended it all together yesterday. And I, if they're going to do it that way, and it may not be in that order, three point shooting, ball screen, throw it into Kofi. But if you go, ball screen, you know, throw it into Kofi, open up the three point shooting. Like you play off those three things. What do you do, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah, Mike, it's almost like it's 3d now, right? Like for so long, you're working in this, it's Kofi post feed, right? And some of those actions really work well. Grandison's a great uh, passer, um, but Kofi can do that work or you just got the Kofi, the ball, he kicks it out, right? You do some of this weave action, maybe you get a three, but now when you had Curbelo, it just, it's that little other dimension that you didn't have without him because Frazier's just not as nimble as him. You know, he's, he's, he's not the same guy. Now he had some great passes to Kofi there, but he's just not as good at it. I mean, there's very few guys who are as good as Andre Corbello. So it's now it's like a 3d offense where it's, 
you're playing 3D chess instead of, you know, yeah. like it's it's really a handful for a defense. And as Brad said yesterday, it's it's pick your poison, but now it's not just shooting and Kofi, it's shooting Kofi and a dribble drive. Yeah, and Hunter Dickinson yesterday in, in the ball screen coverage is funny when when Curbelo got his layup, and it was almost like the one where he kind of like spun it and did a little, put a little, I guess, jelly, as you would say on it, um, jelly on the roll. It, it's funny watching it because Curbelo's so good at the initial setup of the ball screen. Trent's gotten so much better at it too. Like, I'm going to make sure you run into the screen. And the second you run into that screen, immediate advantage for me, dribbling down as the ball handler. Curbelo runs his guy into the screen and comes off. And literally, I, it's, it's the gravity of Kofi Coburn. I, it's, he, Connor Dickinson literally gave Curbelo a wide open layup because the second Curbelo came off and Kofi rolled, Dickinson was so concerned with Kofi that he literally just ran over and chested him. And Curbelo Cur- had a layup line layup. And that's all just, it's all those parts working together. And the last point I'll make about Kofi and the ball screens, and you don't want to get too ball screen happy, but I think it's great when Kofi is setting them and not bailing out early and not just steadily slipping out all the time. It's the ripple effect, right? He sets the screen, he lays wood. Now, Dickinson, Johns, whoever's in ball screen coverage, Dickinson didn't do it on that one, but you have to stay in front of the ball. So now Devon, you know, Devontae Jones has to chase over. He's behind the play. And Trent Frazier, smart, fifth-year senior. I know Kofi just laid wood. I know you think you're behind. I know you think you have to fight over. I am putting on the brakes and shooting it. And you are running into me. Like that is just the game that you can play. And, and, and I think that's part of the reason why they, they had 93 points yesterday and it looked pretty damn easy to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to talk more about Kofi, but he's just so dang good. He's just, he's so dang good. He was patient, uh, but yet decisive. Uh, and boy, I mean, he made Hunter Dickinson, who's in my opinion, the second best center in the league overall, like Zach Eady's great. Right. But like Hunter Dickinson plays 30 minutes a game. Um, he did great defensively. I thought he was locked in on that. And I think that gave him a lot of energy too. uh, you know, and then second half, as you said, just dropped the anvil. He just kept going into him and was so good left over the left shoulder, over the right shoulder, Mike going both hands. Uh, he even had these couple where he took a dribble and like finished around the rim, like a guard. He's, he was just locked in. And it was great to see after a rare bad performance against Ohio state. Yeah. And they put him in different actions yesterday. They, they cleared a side for him in the first half, put him at the elbow and gave him just a 15 foot rip with the right hand. And part of that is, you know, Hunter Dickinson doesn't want to put his hands on you. Doesn't want to foul. And if you're Hunter Dickinson, you almost are like, yeah, I can't blame you, man. Cause when you're out, it looks very bad. Um, so he knows he has to stay on the floor and they, they expose that and they, they put Kofi in different spots. They, they had him rolling. They had him at the elbow. They had him, you know, they even had him in a pistol action at one point. Uh, and look for him, it's, it's old faithful, right? You know, it's when things are, are going wrong, when it's 82 80 and you need a score, when they've cut it to two, we broke it down on the film. What do you go to? go to the horn set, right? Mm-hmm. Every single time and, and throw it in there and middle third of the floor. And it's just, you don't need to get too cute with it, right? You know, you could, Brad Owner could easily be in that timeout 80 to 80. Like, here's my time to show that I'm, I'm this ATO guy. And, you know, and they've shown, I know some like studies have been done. He's, he, he doesn't even need to prove himself on that. It's been, it's been great, but he's able to just say, hey, we're going horns, try to stop it. You know, and, and it's sometimes simple is better. And that's what they do. And they've, they've gotten so much better at it with Grandison setting it up, getting into his guy and saying, hey, I'm going to get into you and I'm going to catch this at the top of the key. You're not pushing me out to 26 feet. Because if you push me out to 26 feet, game of inches, game of milliseconds, that, the air on that pass that goes from 22 feet compared to 26 feet, it's, it's a shorter amount of time from 22 feet. So the, the help can't come in soon enough. If you float it from 26 feet, there's guys that can come in and, and really clamp down on that. Now he doesn't have a look. So all the little details, they, they fine tuned it. And it's, it's been kind of a well-oiled machine here the last few months.
Yeah, I asked Brad about Kofi being clutch. He said, well, he's pretty good. <laughs> so yeah. That's a pretty, pretty good answer to it. Um, Trent, Trent Frazier, another just dagger. Uh, it's, it's great to see. Illinois had a few daggers at uh, Chrysler Center the last couple of years. Uh, but speak to this, Mike, of the balance Chester or the, that Trent has to have of he's been such a good point guard this year, like taking that role back as a lead guard, setting up his teammates, zero turnovers the other day, but also then looking for his own shot. Like that's got to be really difficult to find that, to know that. But I I think Brad Underwood was right. We've talked about it. Be more aggressive. You're such a good, I mean, he's the number five leading scorer all time at Illinois. I know there's an asterisk on that with five years, but it's one of the best bucket getters uh, of recent generations at Illinois. Uh, so it seemed like that game, that's exactly the kind of balance you want from, from Trent Frazier. His maturation as a facilitator has been incredible. We, we've already talked about the maturation on the defensive end and how he's bought in down there. But I think, uh, you know, I'd still like to see him get downhill with that left hand a little bit more. And, and that's not only just to say, hey, Trent, I want you to score more. It's just, it puts so much pressure on those bigs and it gives Kofi that free run. So it's just, hey, you're still facilitating in a way. Facilitating isn't always passing the ball, right? You can facilitate in other ways. And look, he, he just does such a good job of, of compartmentalizing all these different parts of his game, these different you know, aspects of his game. And he's so good defensively, right? He's gotten so much better facilitating. He, he can score the ball. He does all of that and he, he runs the offense. You know, I think sometimes when you have a guy on your team that may not have been your first option as a ball handler, you know, they, they can't really get to their spots. You know, you want to start your offense at 22 feet, but instead you're starting at 24 because he's not comfortable getting into his guy's body. Because if I get into his, my guy's body, he may take it away from me. Trent uses his body. He's gotten so much better at that. I'm starting the offense where I want to start the offense. And the difference that makes with timing with execution. And I think as a fan and as anyone that's watching, you feel pretty darn comfortable when the ball is in Trent Frazier's hands. And for a guy that wasn't the main ball handler coming into the season, not many teams have that, you know, it's like, Hey, we got to rely on this guy. He's more of a score, but we'll have him facilitate this year. Turnovers would be high. Decision-making is not great. They can't compartmentalize all those things like Trent does. So man. Uh, and then the closing, you know, the way, the way he's now shutting games down, I'm excited to see the Trent Frazier montage. Uh, that's going to be whatever, two minutes and 16 seconds like Iowa's, uh, because it's really, it, it's, you see it. I know Illinois fans have been spoiled a little bit because the Iowa's like that. And then now Trent's kind of like that. Go watch a Michigan State game. Yeah. They don't have that. They don't. And it's just who, uh, who okay, I guess it's AJ Hogger now down the stretch and, Walker's had Look, a few big performances here lately. Walker's Walker's done it. Obviously, he he hit the big shot. And look, this whole Tyson Walker late game thing. It's, yeah, you figure it out February twenty fifth, right? You know, it's, and it could have helped you on this losing streak that you've been on. So it, it's a it's a heck of a luxury to have. And you know, I, I think Brad Underwood and the staff are are pretty happy that they had it. We we got to give his praise. I know we talked about his defensive issues. Alfonso Plummer's first half was one for the ages, 23 points. Um, now over the last two games, Mike, he is 14 of 19 from three. He shot 208 threes this year and he's shooting 42% from three. Like it is, it is insane what he's doing. Uh, he's making more threes per game than any Illinois player in history over a single season. He's higher than Luther had. I don't know if he'll play enough games. We'll see. He could be a big part of uh, Illinois playing enough games to help him break Luther heads record. But uh, just in fuego, but as you said, just a little more focus on the defensive end, and you might have a chance to shoot more threes per game and, and be on the court a little longer. Yeah, and the the degree of, of difficulty, right, on those shots. Oh. You know, he, he's going eight for ten in games where he's if they're like step back threes by the bench. It's just, I, I think he's the best shooter that I've seen in college basketball this year, and and a lot of guys. I mean, you, you go look at different parts of the country, right? Dane Goodwin uh, at Notre Dame. I mean, if you want to talk about this, like, sure, pure catch and shoot, you know, you could maybe go for some other guys, but factoring in the full, you know, all of the, the, the degree of difficulty and, and just the way that he gets those shots off. And a lot of them, they're not just catch and shoot. A lot of them's creating off the dribble and he, he's kind of perfected that mid range too. And uh, you have to be hyper aware at all times of him. And, 
and he is, he's much more of a three, he's much more than just a three point shooter. I think he's just, you know, the way he's able to get downhill with that left hand, the way he's able to, to pull up and kind of keep you guessing. But I talked about it. We're in March right now. And I'm just, I'm really not sure that he's going to get the whole defensive end figured out to the point where he's a guy you can't take off the floor is what I'm getting at. I'm not saying that he's a complete zero defensively because he's not. And I think that's what I talked about. That's what can frustrate you at times is it's like, whoa, he has a defensive possession. You're like, okay, you can do it yeah. all the time. It's just, a, it's a focus thing. And uh, you know, he needs to find a way to, to, to figure that out because he starts games, right? And when you're in March, when you're in the tournament, when you're in the sweet 16 and you let your guard down and a team pops out on a 14 to four run to start the game, that could be it. Yep. Like that could be your season. So it's just, there, there needs to be a sense of urgency here from him. Hey man, we don't need you to be Tony Allen. Right. But the assignment stuff, you know, if they're in pistol action on the wing, you just stop going under, stop, stop going under. Like it should happen one time. If it happens one time, get it fixed. It shouldn't happen six times. Not twice. You know, in a row. <laughs> yeah, or, or twice in a row too. Cause that's not only are you kind of letting your team down in that sense, you're letting the opposition get a rhythm. Yeah. Right. And, and you see a lot of the stuff that they run, especially in the second half was, Hey, where's he at? All right, let's, let's go. You know, and, and, and he's got to accept that challenge and he's got to truly have a, a deep care about that. end. I'll show something in the film and I haven't mentioned it. Andre Curbelo, they ran the pistol action. Curbelo was in it. Curbelo goes over like you should fights around Devonte Jones shoots a 14 foot floater on the baseline heavily contested by Curbelo and I know this isn't good podcasting because you can't see me maybe if you catch this on YouTube the second the shot goes in and I'll show it on the film Curbelo claps his hand and is like damn like it bothers him it bothers Andre Curbelo when he gets scored on and that is sometimes the difference yep does it bother you and if it doesn't that's a problem and I and I think that's that's where this emergence of Andre Curbelo looking more comfortably offensively and doing what he does defensively it's going to chew into somebody's minutes. Yeah, that's, that's what I'll say. I had many fans tweeting at me like, "Why is Plummer not playing?" It's like, well, there's another end of the court. <laughs> there's another yeah. end of the court that is a problem, and you're going for 93 points. Scoring was not the problem for Illinois. And the other thing I'll mention too is, look, this isn't every game. Right. Game script is going to determine this. And, and and look at the last two games previous to Michigan, Michigan State. You know, we're up, we're up 12, we're up 14, we're up 16. We need to shut the door here. Right. Or, or, Hey, we're up. We're up. We need, we need offensive execution. We need to get good shots. We need to get stops. And that's the way that we're going to hold on to this lead. So you go Curbelo, mm -hmm. Ohio state. We got to climb back into this thing. We're down 10. We're down 12. We're down 14. Plumber. That's, that's why he's in the game. So, you know, it, it's game script, but I, I think the more that Curbelo figures it out offensively, I don't know. I mean, he's going to take somebody's minutes. Like I said, speaking of figured it out, um, Coleman Hawkins, there might not be a play I liked more than his offensive rebound with a minute left. Um, it was, it was the Dennis Rodman thing. He's like, Oh, is he, is he misses here? It's going there. It's he missing here. It's going there. Uh, he just read where Jacob Grandison shot was going to clank off the rim, went, got to his spot ball went right there. And, and that length, the athleticism obviously showed through just active, just energy. Um, has it clicked for Coleman Hawkins, Mike? And if so, what's that mean for Illinois? I think it has. And, Part of that is just attributing to him being comfortable in his skin again. Uh, you know, I, I think he knows who he is right now. And who he is is an energy and effort guy that's extremely skilled. And that doesn't mean earlier in this, like earlier in the season, Marquette game, all that, you don't need to try to split the defense. You don't need to rip it with your right hand and go downhill and try to make something happen. You are just as potent and you mean just as much, if not more to this team by being the energy and effort guy. We got, hey, we got guys. Putting the ball in the basket, taking care of it. Don't worry about that. Okay, it may come in the form of 10 points like it did against Ohio State. It may come in the form of six points. It may come in the form of zero points. Because not only did he track down that rebound after the Grandison miss to set up the Frazier three, the over the back call yeah. that was drawn was off him going to, going to try to get one too and drawing another foul on Hunter Dickinson. So... He sticks his nose in there. He's aggressive. He plays with fire. He plays with passion. And, those, and, you know, 
he's the type of guy, you know, he gives them a different look offensively. They ran a little bit of that pistol action. I'll show it in the film. It gives you a completely different element, dynamic, whatever you want to call it. But I'll say this, and this is the point that I'll make about Coleman Hawkins. Okay. Give this kid a ton of credit. It is rare. And I, when I say rare, I mean rare for somebody to emerge like this after that much of a decrease in minutes. There are, got, there are players and the majority of them will float off into the abyss and minutes are down. Uh, you know, I was starting early in the year. Now I just played, now I either DNP'd or I, you know, I played six minutes. You become a problem. You're trying to take other guys down with you in the locker room. Like, hey, isn't this some BS? Like, you know, that's how cancer spreads in the locker room. And I think it speaks to this culture. It certainly speaks to Coleman Hawkins and the type of kid he is. And look, there are plenty of times in the past where someone will reemerge because of injuries. Somebody will reemerge because of, you know, COVID. I mean, whatever it may be, he's reemerged. Because he has just made the most of his opportunities. And at times it was four minutes and at times it was nine minutes and he built it back up. And it's just, it's been one of my favorite storylines of the season, because I think it, it truly goes to show you that you play hard, you play with effort, you play the right way, you do the right things. That stuff all comes back to you. Yeah. And just to, just to back up your point, Mike, in seven big 10 games from January 17th to February 8th, he averaged 7.7 minutes per game. This is, this is a guy who's what the second best player of the first three games because Kofi was out, yeah. right? Like that's pretty amazing to go from that to that. And then the last five games, e- even when RJ Melendez was playing well, right? Like, so RJ's injury might open up a little bit more playing time here, but uh, 19.4 minutes per game, the last five games, it's gone from 13 to 26 uh, at Michigan the other day. So kudos to him, kudos to staff for, for getting through to him uh, during through that stretch. And yeah, ku- kudos to, the whole team of, of supporting him and getting him through it because again, he's just something they don't have. Otherwise RJ does a little bit of it, but he's not quite as long. Um, and, and he's that he's their biggest weakness, that four positions, their biggest weakness. So if he can turn that into, uh, I don't know if it's going to be a strength, but a solid position for them, man, again, it's just like Curbelo, Curbelo and Hawkins, those two get going. It's just two things that this team hasn't had most of the year. It's, it's every Big Ten defense's biggest weakness. You know, if you can be potent at that spot, you know, go on down the list. I mean, if you want to call Keegan Murray a four technically in this league, EJ Liddell, I, I mean, they're, they're Jamison Battle. Like, there's a lot of guys in this league who pose a problem for a lot of teams, every team at that spot. And Coleman Hawkins, you can see, not only does he pose a problem for, for teams at the four, but you slide into the five in those Kofi minutes – and I'm not over here lobbying for, for Coleman to play 25 minutes to five. I think there's, that can be taken care of by the potential big 10 player of the year, but in those moments where you have, okay, you know, Kofi's going to play 29 to 32 minutes. So in those eight to 11 minutes, how do we want to use those? And Coleman Hawk is going to keep chewing into a lot of those because you just see the versatility and the way that they can do different things and that pistol action and how he just spread things out. I mean, Alfonso Plummer gets a backdoor cut against Ohio state for just a wide open layup. And maybe in other times, Kofi's down there posting. I mean, who knows? And that, that never happens. So it's not to say that Kofi clogging up the lane is an issue. It just gives you a different wrinkle in those other five to 10 minutes of the game. And those other five to 10 minutes of the game, as we know, can be the difference, can blow the game open, can bring a team back into it. So, you know, he, Coleman's, Coleman's done a lot for this team in the last few weeks. And, and I, I frankly, I don't think he's done doing a lot for this team as we head into March. Well, here we go. March is here, Mike. Um, it starts this week, and we got a huge game March 1st between Wisconsin and Purdue. Illinois is saying boiler up in this one. But Illinois also has to take care of its own business, right, to to ensure that it has a chance for a share of the title. Penn State just lost at Nebraska, right? That, that's a must-win at home, but you can never overlook Penn State. They usually bring it uh, energy-wise. Uh, but then a huge one at home against Iowa, and, and Iowa's cooking right now offensively. So, to see an offense put up 93 is, is encouraging with that one because even if you defend well, Iowa has a chance to go off. But just uh, thoughts for you going into the final week, which is fun as heck. You got the Big Ten player of the year, Big Ten coach of the year. I mean, guard might have Big Ten coach of the year sewed up already. But uh, Big Ten player of the year and the Big Ten championship all up for grabs here. What more can you want <laughs> in, in a race, right? I, I think 
I can speak for myself and I would imagine you as well. I'll be glued to my TV on, on Tuesday, oh. tomorrow night. I will be glued to my TV. I, I you know what I'm saying? Me. I'm I'm saying Jaden Ivey, here you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Johnny Davis crushed you first time. Let's let's see what you got here. Look, it's about as good as it gets if you're a, a neutral fan, yeah. right? And you just want to tune into a game. I mean, you could be a UCLA fan and you're like, man, this Purdue Wisconsin game. It's about as good as it gets. You know, it's it's Wisconsin has a chance to basically lock things up. Mm-hmm. Purdue, if you want to at least get a share, Illinois. Yeah, you're the one, you're the third party here. That's just kind of like, Hey, come on, Purdue. Um, but look, I'll say this. I, I would be genuinely shocked, genuinely shocked if Purdue lost that game. Really? Like I I've been surprised by Wisconsin th- this year. There's no question about it, but I would be absolutely shocked. Piper said the exact same game. thing to me yesterday. He goes, this shocked. matchup screams Purdue. Like they can't stop Edie. They can't stop Trevion Williams, but Johnny Davis is there. <laughs> well, look at the last game. Like, here, like here's the thing. You know, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, Kentucky played Tennessee. Maybe this isn't a good correlation, but you go and look and you say, okay, Kentucky's playing at Tennessee. Oh, why is Tennessee three-point favorites? Kentucky beat them by 30. The other, and then you go and look at that box score, and you're like, oh, Tennessee was three for 30 from three. So unless that happens again, I don't think it's going to be a 30 point win for Kentucky. Now, the way that I would correlate that to this game, unless Johnny Davis goes for 37 and 14 again, which is entirely possible, not only just for Johnny Davis, but against that Purdue defense, entirely possible. I can't see it. I mean, look, they didn't shoot it particularly well in Mackey. So you could also argue that maybe they shoot it well at home. Um, Zach Eady, 24 and 10. Uh, Travion had some foul trouble. I think you only had nine and five, but, but together, I mean, they had 33 and 15. Uh, and, and I would imagine that's probably going to be on the low end of, of what they could do in, in Madison at the Cole center. So look, th- those are the reasons why I think Purdue is going to win that game, but they got to guard somebody. Yes, They got to guard somebody. I, I mean, I think it's a real, I, I was hearing some national media after Michigan state game. It's like, eh, I'm out on Purdue. Um, because when you really look at it historically, yeah. whatever you want to view Purdue as, if you want to look at them as a national title contender, it ain't going to be with this defense. That is quite frankly, and I'm not, this, I'm not speaking of hyperbole, a team with this type of defense has never, never won a national championship ever. They rarely get to the final four, right? And like, not even close. Like it, the, the teams that have been, in, in that realm are, are not even close. I think the one that you can, the one I can think of, this is just off the top of my head. I think UConn in 2011 with Kemba was like 39th, in, maybe 15th in offense, 39th in defense or vice versa. But Purdue is 105. But <laughs> that's, yeah, that's very bad. Uh, that's very bad. So, you know, I, I, I know we're getting into more Purdue's chances to win a title here, but that game in particular, it's going to be a great game environment's going to be insane. Um, but looking ahead too, right? Penn state. I keep going back to it. I was a freshman at the university of Illinois. And we were just getting towards the end of the conference season. Michigan just came into our house and kicked our butt. Uh, you know, they're the fourth ranked team in the country now uh, at that time. They went to Owen 14 Penn state in happy Valley and lost. And that's, that's, that's the Michigan team with Trey Burke that went to the national championship. Yeah. They, it was an ugly game. Now, granted, that Penn State team had Tim Frazier. They had DJ Newville. Like, they had some guys, but they were 0-14 in Big Ten play. That's almost crazier to think about. Tim Frazier and DJ Newville, and you were 0-14. 12-13 was an insane year. But, look, they guard ball screens well. We, we, we've seen that, right? Like, they're top 25 in the country in guarding ball screens. They, they limit you from three. I think they're only giving up 33, 34% from three. But you can almost bet your bottom dollar this is going to be an ugly game. It's going to be an ugly game. But the beauty of it for Illinois is they've proved that they can win both ways. Right? They can win in the 50s. They can win in the 60s. They can win score in 90. They can win give up 85. Like They've won in different ways. So I, I don't worry about that with this, with this Penn State team. But it, they're going to muck it up. They're certainly going to muck it up. And then Iowa, you mentioned Iowa to cap off the week. Wisconsin gets a lot of uh, the take care of the ball. 
I love I was number one in the country. Yep. Right? You know, Wisconsin third, I get that, but Wisconsin's not even first in, in the conference. It's Iowa. So their quality of possession is part of the reason why, you know, they've been able to have such an efficient offense it is because of that. They take care of the ball. And when you mix taking care of the ball and turning teams over, creating more opportunities for you. I mean, I think they're 91st in the country and creating turnovers, but there's a lot of big 10 teams that don't do that. They're second um, in the big 10. Yeah. yeah. They're second in the big 10. So I would imagine Rutgers is first. Uh, someone who, who's up there. Who's first. I would imagine it's Rutgers. Let's look this up. Hold on. But yeah, I was second in the big 10 uh, turnover rate. Northwestern is number one. How about that? Yeah. Good for you. Northwestern. <laughs> All right. Hey, there's something you can hang Rutgers your hat on, I guess. Three. Yeah. Rutgers is three there. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I think that type of disparity between turning you over and not turning it over. Look, I, I don't think Illinois is going to force 18 turnovers in this game. They could, but I, I don't think it's likely. Now what you can't have is you turn over 18 to 20 times. And they've done, they've done a much better job of that. Um, but look, I, you can throw out all the metrics and you got to make shots and you got to limit Keegan Murray and you got to do this. You got, if you want to share this title and I know Tuesday is going to determine that I know Thursday is going to determine that, but if you get to the point here where it's down to Sunday and you need a, a share of this, you better play with energy and you better play with effort and the rest will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, I think you'll be looking at potentially a, a share of the title, which will be, poetic justice after uh yeah. after last year yeah and i think it just mean a lot to the program like I, I know they're focused on what happens in march but i they, they want this uh they they want this bad they, to to cross this one off the list mike to get the big 10 tournament title last year get a big 10 championship it just solidifies everything that's happened really the last five years but really the, the last three years not that they need it uh but it certainly is Hey, the rest of the world, look, look what's happened here at Illinois. Cause I still don't know if people know what the last three years have been at, at Illinois, like the, the big 10 record compared to the rest of the league. They still have what five or six more wins in Wisconsin. The last three years in Wisconsin is probably gonna have two titles in the last three years. So they have that to show for it. But um, I, I think it'd be a, a great crowning achievement for them. And then they can go into the postseason uh, just, just free and be like, okay, now this is where we're really remembered. Yeah, and I know, and, and look, there's, there could very well be a situation where Wisconsin closes out on Tuesday night and you don't get a share. Uh, you mentioned the last, the last three year, last two year, whatever you want to boil those stats into. It, it'd be pretty incredible 10 years from now, looking back on that, this particular three year stretch and thinking, man, how, how did that not result in a Big Ten championship? And, I, and that's, that's kind of what I'm holding out for here. I'm like, hey, maybe the basketball gods – got them here you still got to take care of business obviously but it is amazing because they like, didn't like, last year right the, the basketball gods and and maybe juan howard did not did not help you last year with that. and look I, I think there's an element to this where you know there's going to be there's some three-year-old kid right now that is going to be 18 and 15 years and look back on this these this three years of illinois basketball and be like oh yeah well like they didn't they didn't win a, a big 10 regular season title well hold on a second if you saw it, kid, it was amazing. And, and, and just the, the sustained success and the way they've done it, especially on the road in this conference, it's, it's unheard of. Uh, it's unheard of not only just in the Big Ten Conference, but around the, around the country. It just doesn't happen that often. A lot of teams have that home court advantage, which Illinois does. But on the road, maybe they're more 65% win percentage, you know, anywhere between 55 and 65% what they've been able to do on the road these past few years is absolutely insane. So I think even if it comes to not being a regular season title or a share, I don't ever want this three-year stretch, specifically this two-year stretch to be overlooked because it's been some of the best Illinois basketball that that's been in program history. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I don't like being preachy and telling fans how to feel all the time, Mike, yeah. but sometimes it's like, stop for a second. If it's about the refs or it's about Juwan or whatever it is, and, and don't lose sight of what is happening. Like, like these last three years, this is the second best three-year Big Ten run in Illinois history, like by win percentage. Better than 87-89. And that was like unbelievable teams, right? Um, the only ones that were better were, were the Weber years of 03 through 05. 
And, and obviously he inherited great teams from Bill Self, but that included a 15 and one season for the ages, right? Like it's uh it's pretty amazing. Like that, this group under Underwood, like this Kofi Trent IO group, like this is as good uh, is or better than any other in Illinois history. Like, yeah, you, you want the banners to prove all that. You want the deep NCAA tournament run, but not, nobody's going to take that away. Uh, what, what they've done in the big 10 the last three years. And look, just even just look how the, the conversation and the narrative has shifted. I, I know I, I can speak for myself when I was in the, in those locker rooms from 2012 to 2016, it was bubble talk yeah. the entire year. Oh, like got to have this one to stay on the ball. Now we've gotten to the point where we're like, oh, four seed. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, it's just like, uh, look, I, you know, we would have, I, I know from 2012, 2016, we would have killed to, to, to be, to, for that to be the talk. And look, I know as a fan, it can be frustrating at times. Yeah. Look, I was in those locker rooms. Okay. From, from 2012 to 16, when you're on the bubble, you have a staff that's working their butt off. You know, you like, it's, it's frustrating. It is. And now it's almost like I've experienced that and now seeing it to where the, the, the conversation shifted where it's like, Oh, like are we can get a share of the big 10 title. You know, are we, you know, is it going to, I hope we don't fall into the five twelve matchup. You know, I, it's just, man, I know we move the goalposts. That's what humans do. And I get it. And that's part of it. When you have really good players, when you have really high expectations, but shoot, I, I know I'm cherishing this. Yeah, this stress this stress beats the heck out of bubble stress, right? Or being yeah, okay, like going, think about it. Like I, back in 2014, 2015, we had 19 wins. And basically in order for us to solidify or at least be like, hey, we've moved off the last four out or, or the first four out, last four in thing. We need to get a win in Mackey. And we got off to a 15 to two start, you know? And then PJ Thompson of all people, ends our NCAA tournament hopes and you don't ever want it to come down to 19 wins. Got to get a win in Mackey to feel good about it. Like that. You just, you don't want that. So this is at least a team right now where, but like, there's no bubble talk, right? There's no, Oh, let's stay off the eight, nine line. We don't want to play a one seed in the second round. No, you're talking, you're talking, you win a big 10 tournament. You went out here and win the big 10 tournament. You're probably talking two seed. Yeah. Maybe some things happen where you're the last one seed who knows, but it's going to be a two at the highest. And honestly, I, unless you drop Penn state, Iowa and lose your big 10 game, I don't see you falling past four in my opinion. Um, you know, no, so, if you're the four. No one wants to see now, you know, right. no one wants to see a four if you're the four. Yeah, no question. So I, I think, I mean, think about a one seed, right? You go to the sweet 16, you would be facing a four seed Illinois, right? If I have that, if I have that correctly, right? It would be, and then the two, three would play to me in the, in the elite eight. So look, a lot of stuff to be, to be proud about. And I'm not going to sit here and I'm not talking like this is an end of season awards banquet here, but, <laughs> but look, like it's, it, it just dawned on me, even on this podcast, how just the conversations have changed. Yeah. Right. And, and used to be all bubble. Now it's, it's NCAA seeding. It's two seed, three seed, four seed, share the big 10 title. A lot to be proud of. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Michael Tulip, a lot to uh, a lot to hash out here over the next couple of weeks. We're talking about NCAA seating, Big Ten title. It's going to be fun, though. Uh, it's a lot of fun as March turns here, and we're going to have fans in the stands for all of it, unlike last year. Michael Tulip, true, thanks, true man. Regionals. Uh, true regionals again. Uh, well, I know Illinois could have the, the Milwaukee-Chicago combo here, potentially, which, which would go pretty well for him. Michael, talk to you next week, man. Appreciate it, man.